So, hello everybody. I am Nicholas de Eastleach, Dictus Le Tardif. I'm currently Swartz Draken Herald for Drakenwald. Um, otherwise, I go by the title of Coxworld, um, which is quite handy because the couple of hundreds that I'm talking about today are both in the Coxworlds, uh, both in Gloucestershire. Um, one or two names I've had to go just outside the hundreds uh, to illustrate my points, but for the most part, the hundreds uh, do the job I want. The rest of it is far more legible than the title page. So, contents of what I'm talking about, I'm not sure whether I'll get through all of it, but I thought it would be useful just to have a reference source in terms of the slides afterwards, so everything is in the slides. So the first thing I'm going to cover is what is named. Um, some of the things aren't necessarily obvious. And I'll take a brief look at the original names and the way they drift. Then I'm going to look at probably the biggest section, which is sort of the way the names are modified. Um, so uh, you, you end up with an original name and then some Norman Lord comes in and the name gets modified. I'm going to look at some of the sources that I use the most, uh, sort of the ones that will give you the, I don't know, answer 90% of the things 90% of the time. And then if we get time, I'll go into some of the spelling differences. I'm not entirely sure we'll get time to get to that. It depends uh, how, what the time is and whether people have questions. So what is named? Uh, obviously in the first place is nature. So natural features get named. Obviously rivers, streams, brooks, anything where water flows, water comes out of the ground, water goes into the ground. Um, anything that breaks the flat level ground, so mountains, hills, mounds, valleys going the other way. Then you have things like forests, woods, even individual trees. Uh, my fiance comes from an area of London which is called Honor Oak Park, which is named after a single oak which legend had uh, Queen Elizabeth sat under. I've no idea whether the legend is true, but you, en you, you end up with whole districts named after a single tree. And then there's things like where there isn't trees, glades, clearings, uh, that sort of thing. Then there's the human landscape. So canals, dikes, ditches. I've tried to put these actually in the same sort of order as the natural ones, but they're the human equivalents. And then for, instead of mounds, we've got barrows, earthworks. Going down into the ground, you've got things like mines and quarries. You still get woods, but they tend to be a bit more managed. You get copses, orchards, and then for the flat areas, you have fields, meadows, pastures, enclosures. The last ones are often referred to as closes. Um, there's often quite a lot of dispute about those in the records because the lords want to enclose everything, the tenants hate it. Uh, and then one thing you don't tend to find in the natural landscape, which are roads, highways, and streets if you're in a city. Uh, then you've got where people reside. So you've got obviously at the top end of things you have the castles, you have the manors, and you have names for estates as well, which don't always match the manors, sometimes they do. And just below that you end up with the farms, and you have houses, uh, usually named within towns and cities rather than out in the countryside. You've got inns and shops, and that's very much usually within the village or the town. You have things like barns and yards that are, are named. You see those pop up in wheels and things, um, indentures. Um, not necessarily things you would necessarily think would be named, but they are. And then streets, of course, which show up in uh, towns, even villages. So you find uh, street names occasionally. Then you get the sort of the things that aren't always physical things. Now hamlets and villages are physical collections of houses, as are towns. Then we get to the one which the talk is named after, which are hundreds. And you don't generally get hundreds as a thing. Sometimes the hundreds are named after a village or a town anyway. Sometimes they're not. They're, they're named after so, uh, something in the landscape. Uh, Bright Welsh Barrow, for example or you'll sometimes find them named after the meeting tree for the hundred. 
uh, and sometimes you'll, you'll see the name drift depending on what's going on politically. Some hundreds disappear, some of them reappear. But then there's one name source that I haven't seen a lot of people use when they're registering names in terms of uh, locatives is the hundreds. Then you have cities, of which are actually very few in medieval times. And in de indeed, they, they tend to be very, they tend to be quite small by modern standards. And then you've got the counties. Of course, the other thing that people quite often forget is the ecclesiastical side of things. So you've got chapel, churches, cathedrals to take sort of almost the entire range of the ecclesiastical buildings. And you have monasteries and nunneries, which are, well, we know what they are, um, but they, they tend to be either in towns or sometimes, depending on the, uh, the order, they can be out in the middle of nowhere. Hospitals, which are usually religiously run. Parishes. Parishes are an interesting thing. They're usually named after the largest village in them, but they aren't the same as the village. So you can't match one to one the parish with the village. The parish will have the village in it, but it will also probably have at least two or three hamlets in the territory as well. And then, of course, there's the diocese, which are often named after the counties not always and quite often they won't actually match the county boundaries even if they're named after the counties in terms of the area that they cover um nicholas yes. there is a question here is the slide sheet supposed to be advancing we currently see uh, the slide human landscape ah uh, you're not seeing uh, slides move it's so far been the same slide all the time. No, yeah, I'm not. I'm not getting that either. Oh. Okay. It should be advancing. Yes. What I will do is I'll stick in the editing view, and we'll go through from there. Can you see the editing view? Yes, that's yes, fine. Yes, we can. Yes, and that yeah. will help. Yeah. Okay. So yes, we've been through these slides so far and we've reached this one so you should now be seeing original settlement names so yes when were they named so almost all the names you'll find now were are from the period between the withdrawal of rome and the norman conquest uh although they've been corrupted over time that was when they were the names originally derived from, you'll find a few that can be traced back to Roman times. Um, they're usually the obvious big examples, but most of the smaller names, they're not Roman. They, they come from the sort of the Anglo-Saxon period. The Normans are known to have founded something like 125 clan towns, maybe a few more, but you'll find that they weren't especially fresh names. They're just named after manors or wherever they happen to be plopped so that they just took a name very much like new towns do today they just take a name that's in the area and allocate it to themselves so as a result of that like i say pretty much everything comes from between rome and the norman conquest names for settlements one of the obvious ones are the rivers you'll quite often find uh towns by the river, named for the river, or villages especially. So I've got a couple of examples here. Um, with the, there's a village called Windrush, which is on the river Windrush. Uh, the original name there, which I really don't know how to pronounce properly. Then there's the river Leach, which flows through about two or three hundreds. Um, and they have four villages named after that. Three of them at the time of about the Doomsday Book are all called Leach which is not very handy for distinguishing them, which is one of the reasons why modifications came in. So the four villages, modern names, is East Leach Martin, East Leach Turville, North Leach, and it's actually pronounced Lechlade, um, but it's effectively Leechlade. Then you're named after landscape features, and they can be natural, they can be man-made, so there's a mixture here. Uh, there's Windrush again because the river itself is named 
the, the original name for it translates something like White Fen. Next door village to Windrush is Sherborne. That basically means clear stream. That also happens to be on the Windrush River, so it, it's named after the characteristics of the river at that point. Fairford is on a slightly different village, uh, slightly different river, but in the same sort of area. Again, it's fair, clear uh, ford. It, it was originally a ford before there was a bridge. And you have Hatherup, which is actually named after a farmstead, and it's literally just high farmstead. It's, it's, it's a village on a hill. Now, at the time, it was presumably just a, a farm on top of a hill. And then one of the more interesting ones, which is not in one of the uh, hundreds, I, I, a couple of hundreds, I just picked it out because it's quite a nice one within Gloucestershire, is Deerhurst. And it basically just means a wooded hillock used by deer. Um, but it comes back to the things being named after the natural landscape, and in this case, uh, the animals using that landscape. It wouldn't surprise me actually if this particular name is older uh, than sort of the Anglo-Saxon times. It's, it's got the sort of feel of something that would have been around for a very long time. Then the other one is, the other main source of names is it's someone's thing. The thing can vary. Um, so it's again, it's natural or man-made, but it's regarded as belonging to someone. So there's a hamlet called Arlington, which originally comes from Alfresington. I think that's how you pronounce it. I may, not, I may be wrong, my uh, old English is not great. But it basically transfer, translates as Alfred's farmstead. And any, any village that you'll see with Ton on the end basically was a farmstead of some description. Then there's Bybury, which was a uh, big burg. A burg is a sort of a uh, fortified um, enclosure. It's not... It's not quite to the standard of a fort. It's, it's a sort of fortified settlement. It's not just a farmstead out in the middle of nowhere. It may well have some defences. Then there's Bright World Barrow, which is not a place as such. It's the name of a hundred. There is no village, there is no town called Bright World's Barrow. But I would suspect that the original meeting place for this hundred would have been near or on the barrow itself. And then there's somewhere like Kemp's Ford, which is, uh, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that, but that guy's Ford. Kuna Mavis. Thank you. So then we come to name drift. So the names drift with sound and accompanying written form, and it's something I suspect feeds back on itself because I suspect what what I think happens a lot of the time is you end up with scribes, the curates coming in from outside, the educated guy coming in, doing the writing, they're trying to make sense of the local dialect, which they've not really heard before, writing it down, coming up with something. Then someone else comes along, reads that, and comes phonetically, reads it as something else, especially if they're not local. And, and my suspicion is that the two feed back into each other, which is causing the names to drift. What you don't find, which I have seen suggested in places, is uh, names being trans translated in effect. So you, you've got the old name for something and then it's translated into the new language. That doesn't seem to happen. I've not seen any examples of that. So if they do happen, it's very, very rare. So what you will get is a word that changes, but based on the sound. So the example here is guiding power which was originally named after the Le Peur family, uh, but that sort of got lost over the centuries and it's turned into the word power. The other thing, that's, I've got some very basic generalizations in terms of common changes. You'll quite often see things that originally spelt CH at the beginning will turn into a K. Kempsford is a good example of that. You'll see East spelled E-S-T a, a lot. It becomes E-A-S-T quite late on. And then there's this pattern of E-C-C-H-E. -E. Sometimes one of the C's disappears, the e terminal E drops, and that's almost universally becomes each. Um, so East Leach, where I live now is in Cambridgeshire called Water Beach, exactly the same pattern. And that's in Cambridgeshire. 
So this is the sort of the bulk of the presentation, which is name modifications. And this is where the name has deliberately been changed at some point to usually to distinguish between what would otherwise be settlements of the same name. And we saw that earlier with the River Leach, where very imaginatively there were three villages called exactly the same thing after the name Leach. And after a while it becomes a pain to distinguish which one you mean. So you end up distinguishing them in some fashion. The first way people did this is to add a cardinal direction. So you'll see a lot of places called South, East, West, North. There's a South Rock which distinguishes it from Heatherop. In this case, it's not versus two different cardinal directions. One's high, one's to the south. Uh, outside of the hundreds, in a different hundred, we've got East Dean and West Dean. There's also a Little Dean. There's the Leach example, which I had before, East Leach, North Leach. Now, the thing to remember with these cardinal directions is they're not necessarily an absolute direction. North Leach isn't necessarily the north of the river, East Leach isn't necessarily to the east of the river. In the cases of the leeches, it's to do with their position within their respective hundreds. The North Leach is actually to the north of its hundred. East Le the East Leaches are in the hundred of Brightwell's Barrow, and they're called East Leach, not because they're to the east of the river, but because they're to the east of the hundred. And in actual fact, if you go to the villages, they're on each side of the village, and, and they're so close that you can actually shoot, you could shoot an arrow from one of the churches to the other church over the river. And Nicholas, people have asked what a hundred is. Sorry, say again. People have asked what a hundred is. Oh, a hundred. Yes, a hundred is uh, an administrative area. It's smaller than a county. Uh, it varies in size sometimes from as little as two or three villages up to ooh, 10, 15 villages. And they're basically just an area of administration. I've never really uh, nailed down any objective criteria as to how 100 was originally decided upon. Because their sizes tend to be so different, it, it does seem to come across as somewhat arbitrary. Um, basically, a hundred would have a meeting place where uh, the administrative business of the hundred would take place. So we're talking about the uh, equivalent of slightly more than the manorial court. So sizes and that sort of thing. Uh, some of the meeting places are just trees, it would be a big tree somewhere. Um, I suspect as time went on, they would move them into uh, barns or other big buildings purely because of weather. Um, but yes, they, they date from pre-conquest as well. The hundreds were um, not a Norman invention. They existed uh, prior to the Norman invasion. They're part of the Anglo-Saxon uh, administration. And as I said right at the beginning, they're actually something that's quite often overlooked because they're not something that is physically drawn on a map very often. You'll see villages, you'll see towns, you'll see rivers. But the hundred is very rarely drawn onto the map. Um, so and in terms of modern uh, administrative things, they're big. They're probably, well, they're smaller than a district council, but that would be, if you're familiar with English, English politics, a, a district council covers something usually a bit less than a county, although they're trying to enlarge them these days. Um, so they're smaller than a district council, they're larger than a parish council. Uh, the next thing you would find added is a local feature. Uh, so it might be the river, it might be the marsh. So we've got Borton on the water, we've got Borton on the hill. They're both very close to each other in Gloucestershire. You've got Morton in Marsh. I have no idea why they added in Marsh. It certainly wasn't to distinguish it from another Morton because there aren't any other Mortons nearby. But it is in a Marsh, or was in a Marsh, I should say. The, the Marsh drained long ago. And then you've got Frampton, which is on the River Severn. So sometimes it's just named after the feature itself in sort of generic terms. Sometimes it's named after the feature specifically. Then you get as a result of drift and people forgetting how things were originally named, you get what I call feature redundancy. So there's a place called Clapton on the Hill. 
And Clapton originally basically just means Hill Farmstead or the farmstead on the hill. So in, by adding on the hill later, you've effectively ended up with farmstead on the hill on the hill. And the same with Morton in Marsh. It was originally the Marsh farmstead or the farmstead in the marsh. Came Morton, it just became Morton in people's head. That was just the name. They had no idea what it originally meant. And they stuck in the marsh on again. So you get the farmstead in the marsh in the marsh. I don't, I've never really surveyed how common this is, but these two villages are within about 15 miles of each other. So I suspect it happens a fair bit. The other very common way of modifying a name is to add a saint, usually from the, pa the patron saint of the local parish church. Sometimes the saint ends up getting dropped. Um, so just because you see a name uh, without the saint doesn't necessarily mean it came from a non-saint. Uh, it also means that you don't have to have the saint in the name if you're looking at registering stuff. So we have the two Ampneys that were named after their respective churches. So you have Ampney St. Mary and Ampney St. Peter. Then you have somewhere like Stanley, that became Stanley St. Leonard. And then in this case, the modern name is now Leonard Stanley. So the, the name of the church has actually gone from being an affix and turned into a prefix. And then you have somewhere like East Leach, one of the East Leaches anyway, which was named after its church of St. Martin. It's actually now St. Michael and St. Martin, but at the time it was just St. Martin, and that dropped the saint and stayed in affix, so you, know, you end up with East Leach Martin. And although these are all in their modern spellings, all of these forms had actually come about by the end of our period, so the names that we see now are pretty much what was in existence in the year 1600, um, even if the spellings varied slightly, but even then the spellings a lot over the last 400 years and most of the changes are within our period. And then we come to the addition of names or family names. Now, it's not just the family name which we'll see in a minute but the first one is sort of the family name, the given name. Uh, so usually from the Norman Lord, uh, sometimes they became permanent, sometimes they're only temporary, the, the name, the sort of the affix or the prefix in some situations disappeared as soon as the family lost the territory. So we've got the example of Aston Longchamp, which was named after the, the Longchamp family. That one has disappeared. It's now called Aston Blank, or Cold Aston is, the, is an alias for it. You have East Leach Turville, which was named after the Turville family. That has stuck, as has uh, Casey Compton. In this case, the family name has ended up as a prefix instead of an affix. And the original village was just Compton. We've seen Guiting Power before, which was named after the Purr family. And then we have Maisie Hampton, which I will come to in a little bit more detail later. Again, from the Maisie family, again, a prefix. So there's no set pattern as to whether the family name will come before or after. The other naming pattern is to use a given name. And this isn't as common as a family name, but it's still not rare. Um, so we have a couple of examples here. One of them stuck, which is Colm Rogers, which was named after Roger de, I've forgotten his surname, um, but basically it was Roger. Then East Leach Turville went through a period of a bit of flux with its name. And one of those was East Leach Cecilia, which was named after Quite unusually, actually, um, a secular woman, Cecilia de Evero, if I remember correctly. And then, if we look at Maisie Hampton in more detail, it started off as Hantone in the Doomsday Book, and then quite often you'll see this phase around about the 1200s, where if a name, family name, is taken up you will quite often see the full name of the person appear. So in this case, it's Rogeri de, de Moisi. And then you'll see one or other dropped. Usually the given name will be dropped, but not always. Sometimes it's the surname that's dropped, as we saw with uh, Colm Rogers. So we see as we go forward in time, it becomes Hampton Maisie. And then for some reason, I don't know, I, I don't think it's, it's possible to really tell why in each case, the Maisie got stuck on the front instead. And we end up with Maisie Hampton today. 
but that's the general sort of pattern you'll see with the name changes over time. So it's quite possible to have a place named after a specific individual in, in their full name, given and uh, by name. Sometimes you'll see the addition of an organization. The only one that's local uh, to the area I'm discussing is Temple Guiting, which was originally uh, part of the Templar Estates. Um, so that took its name from the fact that the Templars uh, were the lords of that area. Some of the names get modified by offices rather than by people. Um, so you'll see quite a lot of religious ones. So you, the bishop, the abbot, um, you'll get Bishop's Cleave, you've got Charlton Abbots, you'll see quite a lot of places named as prior. Then of course there's the, the King's place, Charlton King's, or sometimes the prefix, King Stanley. Um, quite often they'll be interchangeable, you, um, the names will, you, Stanley de Roy, for example, will probably happen uh, sort of in the 1200s when the, rest, the records were still in French. Clifford Chambers is an interesting example. That's the secular office, that's the Chamberlain. Um, so that was named after the Chamberlain originally. Then you have sort of adjectives used. Now these are, you can say an addition of an adjective, but it's not generic. You won't find just any adjective. It's quite a small set. Most of them revolve around being greater, lesser, upper, lower, over, under. I've missed under, under, off actually. I've got over, I haven't got under. Or you'll quite often even today find one or two places with the, where the Latin has survived, so magna and parva. And then there's one or two other uh, adjectives, chipping, wick, that sort of thing. Um, I'm sure there are a few more around. Um, these are the common ones in the hundreds uh, in the local area relevant to this particular presentation. Um, but you're not going to see generic adjectives or generic uh, descriptions of things in the names. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Okay. Then you get aliases. Um, you'll find some places are called by two different names at the same time almost. Uh, East Leach Turbo, which keeps popping up, uh, which is not surprising given my given name in the SCA is Nicholas de East Leach. Uh, but East one particular point in time was known by East Leach Turbo. It was also known as Over East Leach, and it was also known as Leach St Andrew. And as we saw earlier, at one point it was also known as um, East Leach Cecilia, but that wasn't actually contemporary with this period when all three were uh, in use. And then you'll get the occasional time when they're completely unrelated. So you, East Leach Martin, which is the neighbouring village, is a good example of that. It is also known as Boothrock, which is obviously uh, a farmstead of some sort. Uh, a f not a farmstead, uh, an enclosure. Um, and Boothrock pops up from about 1310. I don't know why that name came about. I haven't looked into that. Uh, eventually, the village became East Leach Martin as a sort of the official name. It's what you'll find on all the maps today. But you will still find uh, the locals referring to the church as Boothrop Church. And there's also Boothrop House, which is a grade two listed building in, in the parish now. And so the name hasn't completely disappeared, but it's no longer the official name of the village. So the next thing I wanted to look at briefly uh, is sources. So there's the, what I'm calling the usual. So there's all the books in the administrative handbook, um, the no copy sources. There's various articles on our SCA websites and things like, um, uh, what is it, this medieval Scotland and stuff like that. The one thing I would stress is all these are really excellent stuff that's in there is well sourced, it's accurate, but it's not comprehensive. Pretty much all the books that we use were, well, a lot of them are actually printed in the early 20th century, some of them in the middle 20th century, but all of them well before the internet existed. So at the time, the authors had to physically go to whichever archive they were looking at. And this was a period when the archives weren't even necessarily um, organized as county archives. You had a lot of uh, split archives, private archives. Um, so they would have had to visit everything individually in person 
and make notes of what they saw. They wouldn't even have had the ability to take a photograph to refer to later. Um, so the one thing to remember is if it's in there, it's good. If it's not in there, that's not evidence that it didn't happen. It, they're not comprehensive. Having said all that about those books, there are two um, books series that I use a lot. The one is the one I attempted to hold up before the meeting. I was going to hold it up at this point, but I'm not going to bother because as we saw, it's blue and it disappears into the background. Uh, but they're basically called the place names of and they're of the county. Um, but, and they're by the English Place Name Society. And they are the books that pretty much all the names I have used in this presentation and the accompanying spreadsheet have come from. They're excellent source of names uh, and their sources. Some of the sources are slightly out of date in terms of where they're located because of the uh, problem I was talking about before with the uh, private archives and more scattered archives. These days, pretty much all the public archives in England are either in the county archives or in the um, UK national archives. The second set of books is called A History of the County of, but they are part of the Victoria County histories, which were basically started in the Victorian period. And they certainly weren't finished in the period. They are huge tomes. Uh, if you've ever seen one, they generally have a red cover. They are very big books, very detailed histories on all the villages in their respective counties, as well as detailed histories on monasteries, uh, any sort of history that went on anywhere really and these days you don't actually have to buy the books if you go to the website there you will find almost all it's not quite complete but you will find almost all of the Victoria his County histories at that website and I, if you are looking for something that's not even just specifically named if you're looking for something markets or um, cathedrals or church history or the family histories in those villages I, I do recommend those books. This one might surprise a few people Google Maps or their equivalent and yes I really do mean that. If you have a if you're constructing a name for example if you have a sensible constructed name or even in, in quite a lot of cases a silly name stick it into Google Maps and I will reckon you have a greater than 50% chance of actually finding it. And if you do then find it, that then tells you where it is in the country and that enables you to focus your search in terms of period sources on that particular uh, location. Uh, and that helps you with the county archives, it helps you with the Victoria County histories, it helps you with the place name books. Um, and that is a technique I have used quite a few times for submissions in Oscar where they have constructed a name and I've literally typed it into Google Maps and up it pops. And then you just have to, like I say, uh, look back. And the reason this works is because almost all modern names existed in period. I can think of very few, or any, I don't think I can think of any names I've come across in modern England that didn't exist in period. And an example of this is just down the road from where I live, just north of Cambridge, they're building an entirely new town called Norstow. It doesn't exist in terms of a, a name, in terms of villages or counties or uh, towns, but it actually, back to the old hundreds that we were talking about earlier, it used to be the name of the, of the hundred in, uh, containing the nearby villages. So even though it's a completely new town, the name is not new. And then the one I've mentioned before, the National Archives at Kew in London. You can visit them in person, but of course, I suspect I'm about the only one on the call that's actually in England. I may not be, but given the time, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but they do have the Discovery Catalogue, which is online. It's an excellent catalogue. These days, it doesn't just cover the National Archives. It covers, I think, all of the county archives. It certainly covers most of them. Um, it will tell you which archive the, the result is coming from. The nice thing that I like about the Discovery Catalogue is not all, but the vast majority of index entries are not normalised. 
And in many cases, it's obvious because they will actually put the normalized name and uh, the name as it is in the document. The other nice thing about the archives is it has a lot of digitized material. Um, the two, actually one that's just popped into my head that I didn't put down is the wills, the PROB 11 series, um, which is the wills uh, that were recorded at the Prerogative Court of Canterbury, and the SC8 series, which is basically petitions. And this is a series, again, I've used a lot for names, especially in the sort of the period between sort of 13th, 14th century. Um, most of the documents are in French, but uh, if you look at the first two, three lines, you'll see the names of people, you'll see where they're from. Most of the names are locatives in and of themselves, so it's an excellent place to A, find a name and then B, confirm for yourself uh, that the name is as it appears in the document. So we have a bit of time, it's about quarter two. I have a, a section on spelling changes, or we could go to questions at this point. And that really comes down, I guess, to whether people have a lot of questions or not. Um, it would probably be best to deal with whatever questions we have first. Uh, we, I, I think we can, this is a good thing about the participants list and the erections, we can ask a question like who would want to continue with spelling and if those people just all signal yes that um like yes is spelling and no is questions and if just people um made this corresponding reaction then we could we have a simple count of what people want one yes for spelling i have six yeses and no no so far so everybody wants spelling yeah. apparently Okay, we'll take abstention as going along with the rest. Spelling, okay, that's if everybody wants spelling. I haven't had a single, there's not a single no flag at all. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we'll go on to the spelling side of things. The first thing to emphasize is there is no standard spelling. In period, there are no dictionaries, there is no standard spelling. In, in terms of uh, what we do in the SCA, in my personal opinion, we worry about it a lot too much. We, spell, we, we submit things and they are forever frozen in that particular spelling unless the person decides not to. I can think of one person in Drakenbar particularly who makes a particular point of spelling their name differently every time they register for an event. Um, but in period, spelling is completely unimportant. As long as it's phonetic and people can understand what the name is, that's for them, that's fine. So spelling is generally phonetic but I will qualify that with saying it's phonetic for whoever the scribe was. Uh, so if the scribe comes from outside of area, they may well use a different combination of letters for the same sound, or they may well interpret the sound differently in terms of dialect than a local would. Um, which is why I think a lot of the time we get such a varied amount of spelling. So first thing in names, the spaces are optional. Uh, so you'll see names like, well, this is the uh, Brightwell's Barrow in modern terms, with and without a space. West Dean, again, with and without a space. Wick Risington, I've gone for a slightly older version, without a space. In modern terms, it has the space. Again, East Leach Turville, and because it's a sort of a combination word, for the first word, you actually get the possibility of two spaces in this, or no spaces at all in this particular case the east has actually been dropped. Uh, temp uh, sometimes you will find that uh, people will revert to sort of just leech turbo. I think probably because they've got the turbo to identify it. The terminal E is almost quantum in the way that it appears and disappears in and out of the vacuum. Uh, and almost any name or word for that matter, which has an E on the end, you will also find without an E on the end. So you find East Leach Turville, you'll find Oldsworth, for example, with and without the terminal E. You'll also find that the same rule applies to syllables within the word. So we've got the examples here of Lechlade and Fairford, which drop and 
have their ease in all sorts of combinations. So you can have electrolyte without with only the one e, or you can have two e's or three e's. Um, yeah, basically, if, if if you see a name, I will not be at all bothered by the fact that you have have or have not put the terminal e on it. Double consonants. It's another common thing you'll see. Uh, I've never really worked out a hard and strong rule as to where the double consonants will appear. Um, quite often at the end of words, as in the Hatherup case, the sort of the leech case I referred to, E double C will occur quite a lot. Um, and then you've got other doubles like Turville, for example. Uh, chemist foot is an earlier form of Kemp's foot. Again, you've got the double M. And then Barrington, for example, is another one where you've got the double word, the double letter appearing. Okay. Then you've got things like letter substitutions, and there are quite a few of these. I've got four examples specifically here. A and E will swap a fair bit. So you've got um, Heathrop and Heathrop. Heathrop is actually a modern name, but for example comes from Hatherup, which we saw earlier. It's an early form of Hatherup. Then we have the forms of Eastleach, where it's actually the first letter that's changing. The very common one in, you'll see in English and in French all the time, in English records at least, is the IY swap. Um, you, you'll see, you will see it everywhere. You'll see it even in the same sentence. Um, so we've got what is Aylwin, which is actually part of the name Colnes and Aldwins now. You've got two eyes. They will and have both changed independently and together. The other one is C H. Another one is C H K. Uh, you'll see that it sort of happens more 1200s, 1300s. You'll see C H and K swap a bit. And then, of course, the last one tends to be more of a, a writing style thing, I think, more than an actual letter switch. It's a switch between U and V, and probably people uh, showing off how much classical Latin they know by not using the U and sticking with the V instead. You end up with slightly larger comb letter combination switches as well. Um, so Morton is a good example. There's two variants of Morton here to start with. There's the one with the E in, uh, as I was saying earlier about E's dropping and not. You'll end up with O-R-E, O-O-R, O-U-R. It wouldn't surprise me to find other combinations. You will also find the O-R when it's bare tends to switch with U-R. It doesn't seem to happen when the E is present, which suggests maybe there's a slightly different pronunciation. Uh, you've got places like Newton, you will find the U and W swap quite a lot. That happens with uh, personal names as well. I've recently been doing a bit of research into a family called Rawbone, uh, spelt R-A-W, sometimes uh, for a period it became R-A-U. So it's a, it's a very common switch, sometimes for A-U and A-W also to swap. You've got E-R-I-R, -R, and then you've got things like Fairford, where the A, E, and the I, Y all swap together. And you can end up in all sorts of various combinations. Usually the combinations are the kind of things you will find misspelt today. Um, so if you think about the way people misspell their words today, I mean, the one most people think about are to, there, that sort of thing. That's exactly the sort of changes you will see in period. Um, again, because you've got the different ways of representing the same sound. And it's only in sort of modern times that we've actually formalized which, word, which uh, variant for which sound each word uses. So that does bring me to the end of my presentation. Um, I apologize for the fact that the presentation mode didn't seem to work properly within Zoom and we had to use the editing mode, but I think hopefully everybody saw all the slides in the end. I will just- It was say, just fine. <laughs> good, good. Um, the that's other- fine, Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, the other two things I will just say is the two things that accompany this uh, presentation uh, in terms of 
uh, materials are the spreadsheet. Uh, which it's based on the 200s, one Sprite Welsh Barrow, and it's completely gone out of my head what the name of the other one was. Um, but there are neighbouring hundreds in Gloucestershire. 100 I did in quite a bit of detail. All the names actually come out of the uh, place names of Gloucestershire by the English Place Name Society. And it gives you some idea of how the names drifted over time, how the spellings fluctuate um, in, over time, and really how unimportant the spelling is to the people at the time. The second one just <coughs> uh, focuses on the original names because I, I find those quite interesting. And then the um, other spreadsheet, which I also have as a database, a LibreOffice uh, database, if anyone is interested, is sort of the things that are below settlement level. So they're the uh, houses, the inns, the roads, the names of fields, that sort of stuff, something that we don't see a lot. Um, and there's quite a few articles about inn names, etc. But there's not a lot I've seen that are sort of extracted, just ordinary house names or the names of um, farms and that sort of stuff. Um, so what I have done is use the National Ar Archives Discovery Catalogue and just put in particular search into that. And I have found that there's about a couple of thousand results, which was a few more than I was expecting. So, I've, so far I've covered the series, all the series beginning with E, um, which comes out to, I forget how many records, I think it was about 188 records, but a lot of those records had multiple names in, which is why there's far more than that terms of the names. Um, I personally find the database a bit more usable than the spreadsheet, but um, it's really down to personal preference there. Uh.